We are continuing our discussion on the coronavirus or COVID-19 pandemic. And with new case numbers declining throughout the country and here in Florida, many residents are questioning what we should do next. The CDC has issued new face mask recommendations for the fully vaccinated and Orange County government has lifted all of its mandates. So what does all of this mean for you? Well, on this special edition of Healthy Connections, we're gonna get an up-to-date look at where we are as a community dealing with this pandemic. Let's get an update from our state medical professionals and joining us is Alvina Chu, epidemiologist with the Florida Department of Health in Orange County. Alvina, always good to see you. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. So Alvina, tell us about the new CDC mask recommendations and, and new guidelines in general that are coming out of the CDC. So really in this context of the, the great um, strides we've made with vaccinating our population, um, we've seen a marked decrease in the number of new cases that occur each day and particularly in Central Florida, um, our 14 day uh, rolling average for percent positivity has been under 4% for the last several days and been under 5% um, our target goal um, since for the last couple of weeks. And so in, in light of the increasing immunity that we're seeing in our community, the, the guidelines have sort of been scaled back a little bit to allow those who per, those persons who are vaccinated to, you know, move back to normal functions. So uh, essentially we believe in the vaccine and the vaccine is good and it protects us. And so um, the, mask man, the mask recommendations are for those who um, still might be susceptible to becoming infected and for those persons who might be around vulnerable populations, um, we recommend that people still continue those pandemic precautions um, so that for the rest of our population who is not yet protected um, from vaccination, that we can keep them from becoming severely ill or um, hospitalized or even potentially uh, have worse outcomes like death. When in doubt, wear your mask ultimately. And so where can people get vaccines now? I know some of the sites have closed, so where can people get vaccines? So currently there are several retail locations. So the retail um, pharmacy program um, that's in conjunction with the federal government and also with our retail partners here in Orange County, there's um, over 120 plus sites um, such as retail pharmacies. Uh, there's a list on the Orange County um, government website that can tell you. There's also some moving or satellite um, vaccination sites that are being run in conjunction with um, our state of Florida and also with FEMA uh, to provide vaccines in vulnerable populations or in specific targeted communities um, for those who where access to the vaccine might be a little bit more difficult. And so those change location depending on, um, you know, the need and also the the rate, target vaccination rate in those communities. And so you can also get those updates from the Orange County government website. And, and still, I believe Barnett Park um, is a is a site where you can get um, free vaccination and testing continues there. That's great. And for those of us who are vaccinated already, will we need a booster shot in six to 12 months? Has, has the has the data come in telling us what's next? So we're still still looking into that. So there is the potential as with um, potential mutations um, of the virus as it continues to circulate around globally that there might be a time when a booster might be needed to amp up the immunity that we've already developed um, to help protect from any new variations or new genetic mutations. Um, so in order to keep that immunity effective, there might potentially be a booster in the future. And this is not necessarily unheard of in um, situations like this, so with viruses that uh, are quite infectious and can rapidly mutate. So herd immunity is something that has been tossed around. And, and from my understanding, we need to be somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of of a population to to have herd immunity. Is that something you think we'll achieve at all? I think it's a goal that we really are working towards. Um, so there, there isn't exact, there's no magical number 
per se, that once you cross it, a population is specifically um, protected. So what we're talking about is community immunity and the um, there might be eventually some pockets that of, uh, of our community that remain unvaccinated at a rate, say, higher or lower than average. And so the, the concept of herd immunity, if we're talking about a general overall population, is, is the higher the number goes, the better it is for us. Um, so we know we will still have to deal with certain um, segments of the population who might be under vaccinated, um, you know, particular communities or small pockets, and that's where the outbreaks may occur eventually in the future. But what we're working towards is reducing as much as possible um, the severe, hospitaliz severe hospitalizations and deaths for vaccination. For those who are hesitant about getting the vaccine, what do you tell them? What, at this point where we have so many people who've been vaccinated, we had such good momentum. What, what, what do you tell people who are still on the fence or hesitant to get a vaccine? Well, the virus is still with us, um, so it's not it's not zero. It still circulates in certain parts of our community. It's circulating um, at a higher rate than in other parts. And so we would still want our most vulnerable persons in who are not yet protected um, to get the vaccine to prevent severe hospitalization and death. Unfortunately, even with the low case numbers, we are still seeing um, persons who, unfortunately, because they're very vulnerable, uh, still succumb to the virus and die. And so this is what we're trying to do with the vaccine is number one, um, create enough immunity where we can reduce levels so that the virus doesn't mutate outside of our um, ability to be protected from it, either from natural infection or from the vaccine. And then also our goal is to reduce people from the most severe outcomes. And so while there is high vaccination rates in some places, there's still low vaccination rates um, in others. And so in order to get, until all of us are protected, none of us are protected. So we still have the virus around with us. Well, Alvino, we always appreciate you uh, coming on and keeping us informed from the front lines of this pandemic. And uh, thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much. And we'll be right back with more, stay with us. Communities here in Central Florida are reopening and yet COVID-19 is continuing to negatively impact the sense of well-being and mental health of many local residents. Creating a sense of purpose and positive aging experiences are part of the core mission of skilled nursing facilities. And Latanja Rivers uh, with Solaris Healthcare of Windermere is here to explain how the lessons learned in nursing facilities are transferable to the community. Latanja, well, thank you for being with us. And thank you for having me. Let's talk a little bit about the skilled nurses and, and what that is. What is skilled nursing? So a skilled nursing facility is a medical facility that offers 24 hour care and services for someone who needs uh, rehabilitation or someone who may be seeking long term care. And you know, now that we are emerging from uh, COVID, uh, the pandemic slowly, a lot of people are, are seeking purpose. And one of the important things that these facilities do is really help people to find that purpose. Why is that so important? Well, for our seniors, it's very important. So um, in a skilled nursing facility, per the state guidelines, you have to have um, an activities director. So that activities director, her responsibility is to help those residents find purpose. And the way that she does that is by creating activities in the facility that will get them out to socialize. Um, she create activities, um, spiritual activities. We have churches that will come in and provide some spiritual services and connection with our residents. Also emotional and also um, just a sense of purpose in being in a facility, aging, being away from your family members. We feel that it's very important, the state feels that it's very important that they interact social, um, that they interact 
with our staff and family members while they're there to make them have, um, to help them have a sense of purpose or feel a sense of purpose. You know, being away from home, being in, in just leaving the hospital, most of them, they are, you know, in a position where they could become depressed. I would imagine that this was an issue with people in nursing facilities prior to COVID. Before COVID. But after COVID, how has that changed? I mean, what are the activities like now? So um, our activities are really basically the same. Um, so I think what really um, mattered the most when it came to our activities is getting the residents to realize that they kind of would be on their own, no family to visit. Um, so really, we all became activities directors. So what we wanted to do is make our residents um, feel like they still had purpose. We would get them out of the rooms. Of course, we would follow the state guidelines as far as you know the COVID restrictions are concerned. We would take them out for walks. Uh, we were doing that before. We were still able to do that. The biggest issue with us was just not having the family members to visit. So we became family. We already felt like we were family anyways, but we became much closer during COVID. You know, for people who are dealing with this pandemic, which is everybody, mm -hmm. um, dealing with isolation is tough for people that are, you know, tech savvy and, and that have other people around them. It still was very isolating at some points last year. Mm -hmm. How have friendships and relationships played a part in, in getting people in a nursing facility to be more connected? So it's played a big part and uh, we work very hard to keep those connections going. So um, one thing we did is we created, um, we have a bay window in our lobby. So we created an area where family and friends could walk up, church members could walk up and uh, still have relationships with, um, with uh, our residents during COVID when we couldn't allow any visitors in the building. So they would have a cell phone, um, the, uh, the visiting person would have a cell phone as well. We did use some iPads too. Um, so we just had to create, get really creative in being able to offer that, that um, support they needed when we were basically shut down to the public. Is there any aspect of what you do in that, that the facility that can be transferred to a community setting or even into homes where people oh, go home? Oh, most definitely. So um, as you probably know, in a skilled nursing facility, we have patients, uh, residents that live there, That's they are home. Then we have residents who will be returning to the community. So they are taught skills in the rehab center that will, will allow them to continue to be in a home setting, how to get in and out of the shower, how to um, get in and out of bed. How many seniors do we fall out of bed? I mean, that's a big issue. Um, so the skills that they're taught in rehab, even the skills in the activities department um, will help them be able to remain in their home home and in a home setting, whether they are living alone, ALF, returning home with family members, it will help them to be able to be live in place much longer. And those for those who are um, either returning home with family members or who have family members at home that they're caring for, uh -huh. what are the resources that are available to them to help them with the sense of purpose and connection? So in every skilled nursing facility, there's a discharge planner. That discharge planner will discharge them with resources for physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy if needed. Um, services for um, non-skilled services and non-skilled services just meaning someone that may come by and help you in and out of the shower, help you with dishes, help you get to the doctor's appointment. Um, so they leave with a host of resources uh, that will allow them to continue to age in the community and outside of a facility. Where can people get more information about what uh, the, the nursing facility and what some of the resources are? So I always urge people to go to um, myflorida.com. There's a lot of information on aging there. Uh, you, will, you can also go to 
um, your local aging centers. There's a lot of them across town that will offer um, resources. And again, when you leave our facility, you leave with a host of resources. So I, I would continue to, my number one resource for people when they leave our facility is myflorida.com. Anything on aging, how the facilities are licensed, what we're supposed to do, um, how we follow the guidelines and the criteria for um, skilled nursing facilities. If you go there, you'll know exactly what you need to know about any skilled nursing facility, about aging, and about um, community resources related to aging. Well, Latanja, thank you for being with us today. It's a pleasure um, meeting you, and also thank you for the work that you do in the community. You're so welcome, and thank you for having me. And we'll be right back with more. Stay with us. We've heard from a variety of leaders today trying to keep us informed about the coronavirus from local government, the medical community who's on the front lines dealing with this pandemic and organizations who continue to serve our community. And of course, we are also here to help you keep making those healthy connections. Stay safe.